Today we're stepping aside from our usual topic of all things Murdoch for something very important. Something that has affected people that I love and could be affecting you or someone you love. I just found this out a few days ago and have been immersed in research that I hope could help someone else. Not everything will be covered in this episode, so please be sure to come back to episode 2, which will show how these allegations were actually carried out in real life. Let's get started. This is a special report by Cassidy O'Connell. Is your doctor getting rich from writing your prescriptions? Welcome. I remember years ago, a friend was born with cystic fibrosis. Back in the day, children born with cystic fibrosis rarely reached adulthood and were in a battle with their own bodies for every breath they took. Medical research and clinical trials have changed that, with the life expectancy in 2008 being only 26, and as of 2022, it is now 66. This is an amazing turnaround in a short time. And this is the point of medical research and clinical trials. In my friend's case, his parents would be informed by his specialists what treatments were available for trials, what the dangers were, what the medicine hoped to accomplish, and so on. After being educated well, they chose which trials they were up to trying. My friend was given these treatments free of charge. His progress and any unwanted side effects clearly monitored and he was compensated for his participation. In his case, his chances of reaching adulthood were slim. So it makes the situation more dire, more urgent, and more worth certain risks. But what if you were simply being given experimental drugs or therapies without your consent, without compensation? without even your knowledge that you were being used as a guinea pig. Even more, that your doctor was being handsomely compensated for using you in this manner. Well, this is exactly what is happening. It's just happened to two of my loved ones. A member of my family was hospitalized when her body had swelled up and she was having chest pain so intense that the ER doctors at first thought that she had suffered a heart attack. Her heartbeat was irregular, erratic, and she was admitted to the hospital for several days. She has Crest Syndrome. Not many have heard of this. It's a rare autoimmune disorder. In the past, she was diagnosed with COPD, a diagnosis they're no longer sure of, and things got even more complicated when she was recently also diagnosed with Parkinson's. Possibly because of her autoimmune disorder, she has had reactions to a lot of medications, and her doctors are well aware of this. Her medical care has been difficult because when treating one of her diseases, the others have to be taken into account. She has a rheumatologist, a pulmonologist, a cardiologist, and a neurologist, and they are not all in the same group, of course, so it's always difficult to keep them all updated on what's going on with her. It's also difficult for them to know how best to treat her because they have to keep her other illnesses in mind, which are outside the specific things they may be treating. However, we had felt that she had a pretty good team. One of the things about Crest is that in later stages, it begins to seriously affect the lungs and heart. She had begun to struggle with keeping her blood pressure under control as well as having circulation problems. So her rheumatologist had introduced a new medicine he wanted her to try. It was discussed in her family and ultimately decided it wasn't worth the risks to try. More recently, she was told that Crest was going to make her pulmonary hypertension even worse, and her pulmonologist told her that she really needed to try a prescription that would slow that down. The medicine was very expensive. Thousands of dollars per month, and her insurance would not cover it. Never fear, she was told. We have a care team that will work with your insurance and help cover the cost. They'll be contacting you. Contact her, they did. But before we get into that, Let's go back to her hospitalization. She had begun the new prescription only two weeks before this hospitalization and had spent two nights with so much pain in the upper right side of her back that she was unable to lay down. Instead, had sat up all night with her husband rubbing her back. She hadn't told her kids until her legs had swollen up and that's when they had her rushed to the ER. The ER was quite full and it started looking like they were going to send her home. 
In desperation, one of her daughters called her pulmonologist and begged him to intervene. He said that doctors used to be able to do direct admits, but since COVID, that had changed, but that he would do what he could. He did, and they decided to admit her. At first, they told her there wasn't a room available, and she would have to wait until things slowed down, and they would put her in a room in the ER until a room became available the next day. As she sat in the waiting room, frail and sick, a nurse came out and said, By some miracle, a room has opened up. We're taking you there now. She was immediately taken off the new medicines and was given a strong diuretic to get all the excess water out of her body. He told the family that she had decompensated congestive heart failure and damage to the left side of her heart. Though saddened by that news, the family was so grateful for the pulmonologist. He'd saved her. He was the hero. It was a Friday night. On Saturday, the hero pulmonologist had stopped in and had a warm, cheery conversation with the family. He spoke about the importance of a low-salt diet, after which he amused us with the stories of his own limitations of salt in his diet, even though he was young and healthy, and the family was all impressed. He stayed for a while, and as he left the room, there was happy chatter about what a wonderful doctor he was. So personable. No one realized at that moment that, in fact, he had little to no information about her results or condition. They had heard more about him than they had about their mother. Because of the suspected heart attack, she was also to be seen by a cardiologist. A different doctor from her cardio group was on call for the weekend. He had come after visiting hours, and his bedside manner was a little gruff and had made her feel intimidated. On Sunday, after hearing this, her protective daughters decided they were not going to leave her alone with the mean doctor and had stayed past visiting hours so that they could be there when he came. He was nice enough that night, but had not looked at her chart before coming into the room, so when she asked him questions, he didn't have answers. He asked jokingly whether her daughters were there as bodyguards, to which one of them answered, You better believe it. Because, after all, they were there to ensure Mr. Mean Doctor wasn't mean to their mom. He disappeared down the hall to look at her chart and quickly came back with a whole new attitude. He remarked how she didn't look like the usual heart patient, and he had a friend like that who went long untreated because he, too, didn't fit the typical heart patient look. He revealed some of the results and noted that her oxygen levels were very low while she was asleep. Hmm, thought her daughters. Funny, the pulmonologist, who should be the one monitoring her breathing, hadn't noticed this. Careful of what he was saying, he asked how long she'd been on this new medicine, and when he learned it had only been two weeks, he remarked that maybe he wasn't as smart as the other doctor and tended to begin treatments that he called low-hanging fruit as first steps in care. He hinted without fully saying that perhaps the medicines might have had a hand in this rapid turn of events and said that with his patients, he might start out with oxygen and see where things went from there. If that didn't work fine, he would move on to something else, but that oxygen brings immediate benefits with absolutely zero side effects, so that's where he likes to start. Oxygen might help her sleep better, resulting in her feeling better during the day. It was a win-win. Suddenly, Dr. Mean was making sense. Yes, yes, we'd love to try that, said everyone. He said, okay, I'll order it, and we can release you tonight. The oxygen will be delivered to you on Monday. He left. Everyone felt relieved, and the daughters, having done their duty, got ready to leave. As they stepped outside the room, they see Dr. Not-So-Mean, after all, rushing back to their mom's room. He had trails of paper in his hand, so back into the room they all went. Mrs. Mom, was your heart racing twenty minutes ago? Yes, Mrs. Mom admitted sheepishly, while the daughters looked at her wondering why she hadn't said anything. You were having an SVT, a type of heart event. In fact, You've had several since you've been here. I've printed them out for you. Please take these to your cardiologist within the next two weeks. You can still go home, but I'm getting that oxygen sent to you right away. And so it was, late on a Sunday night, the oxygen arrived and was set up for her immediate use. Hmm. Why hadn't the nice hero pulmonologist found any of this, they wondered. Unfortunately, she got a respiratory virus a short time later, and it diminished her oxygen even more. She's been asking her pulmonologist for weeks to increase it, but it has still not happened. So much for heroes. 
Last week, she had a scheduled arteriogram where her cardiologist went in, got a good look at her heart and also her lungs. Guess what? She didn't have congestive heart failure. She doesn't have blockages. She didn't need stents. Her heart and veins looked pretty good for a woman her age. Two of her daughters went back to the house with her after her procedure and in the course of conversation were told how this medicine had been issued. They had, in fact, contacted her. She had been asked to sign papers that were explained to be so that they could set up financial support to cover the medicine since it was not covered by her insurance. A helpful woman called often to ask how things were going and get this, she would always ask whether this conversation was being recorded or if anyone else was there listening. The hairs on the back of her daughter's neck stood up. Wait, what? Yes, she would ask this every time, every phone call. When Mrs. Mom asked her why she couldn't just pick up her prescription at her regular pharmacy, she was assured it was because of this program. After all, this woman was her pal, as she described herself, leaving the daughters to wonder what pal stood for. Mrs. Mom wondered why there seemed to be a lot of clicks going on on the other end of the line during these phone calls. Was she being recorded? Some of the questions seemed odd, so she asked Miss Pal directly, Is this a clinical trial? Oh no, Miss Pal had assured her. Because I don't want to be a guinea pig, Mrs. Mom continued. Oh no, of course not, said Mrs. Pal. Not only did the medicine not come from a regular pharmacy, it came with a whole care pack, a big box with pamphlets, a letter, and a lovely little gift bag. Gift bag? Since when do prescriptions come in this way? There were forms to sign that Mrs. Mom had had the good sense to make copies of, but these forms are so carefully worded that it made the daughters even more suspicious. Daughter one photographed the box, the bottle of medicine, scanned every piece of paper to take home and research. And guess what she found? When you research the side effects on their website, you have to click on as a patient or healthcare representative. Daughter thought, if I click healthcare representative, I might be asked for credentials. So she clicked patient. Very few side effects listed. Side effects such as nausea, simple things. She backed out and decided to click healthcare representative. And wow, a whole new list of side effects appeared, including decompensated heart failure. Exactly what she had been diagnosed with in the hospital, but was not weeks later, once she was off the meds and after treatment for the sudden onset edema. Is it reasonable to conclude that Dr. Not-So-Mean-After-All was right about the medicine? After hearing this story, I started researching this sort of thing, and I found some very helpful information. There's a website called Dollars for Doctors that is doing everything they can to expose how pharmaceutical companies are paying millions and millions of dollars to doctors for writing prescriptions for their high-cost medicine. They have a search tool that you can type in any doctor's name and find out if they're taking money from pharmaceutical companies. Mrs. Mom's doctor was there. There's a list of hospitals who take the most money from pharmaceutical companies. The doctors who take the most, some of which who've now faced lawsuits for it, and which pharmaceutical companies are paying the most. If you suspect a loved one or yourself are being given something that is being used to profit your doctor and the pharmaceutical company, please use their search tool to find out. If you can't figure it out, I will be happy to help you look it up. I'm linking this wonderful website in comments for you. It's very eye-opening to see how many, not just millions, but billions of dollars pharmaceutical companies are paying doctors and hospitals. Why? There's got to be a reason, and we'll get to that. After finding this out and telling Mrs. Mom's family, Daughter 2 mentioned that she had recently been put on a new prescription that requires someone to follow up with her every two weeks. In both of these cases, it was not the doctor following up, but the pharmaceutical company themselves. I said, that doesn't sound right. I looked her doctor up too, and guess what? He's been paid $369,000 by pharmaceutical companies. She immediately made an appointment for a second opinion and was told that the doctor had jumped the gun 
by putting her on this prescription and took her off of the prescription and they're doing further testing at this moment. So what's going on here? After some investigating, I found some important facts. Now I have it at the bottom of my screen, but for those who may just be listening and not watching, I want to say I am not a healthcare professional. I am not certified in any way to give medical advice at all, and that's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm telling you an experience that happened in my family, and I'll be reading from some public documents that have been put out. I'm not advising you not to take medication, not to trust your doctor, not to use medical devices, or anything like that. I wanted to share this experience and share this website that can help you to make sure that how you're being treated or how your loved ones are being treated are in harmony with what is acceptable to you. In fact, at this time, I want to extend a welcome to any healthcare professionals or attorneys who specialize in medical law to put any information that I can use or share in comments. Prescription drugs have a patent life of 20 years. After those 20 years, they can be copied by generic brands, which are much more low cost and become the preferred choice for patients and insurance companies. Therefore, pharmaceutical companies immediately begin working on new medicines that can take the place of their latest medicine to restart a new 20-year patent. This may be combining with another drug, changing doses, the drug being used for a different indication, or things like this. Since clinical trials last years, this process is constantly going on. A second thing I learned, when a drug is approved by the FDA, it's very specific what dose may be used and what it may be indicated for. Indicated for just means what illness it can be used for. So for example, we've recently seen an explosion of drugs like Ozempic being used for weight loss. Initially, they were used for diabetes. They were in clinical trials for diabetes and that's the only approval that they had. Once it was discovered that they caused weight loss, even though they had FDA approval for diabetes, it did not make them automatically approved as weight loss drugs. It was only after applications to the FDA were approved that this prescription could be written for weight loss without diabetes. But here's the thing. It did not stop unscrupulous doctors from prescribing it to clients that did not have diabetes before the actual approval. So how far reaching is this problem? And is it possible that you or someone you love can be affected by it? I hope you'll stay tuned to this mini-series for more information as we'll walk together through this messy, messy world of pharmaceuticals. A double-edged sword that can save your life or take it away. Let's look at some statistics. These are companies that have had to pay damages and the amounts they've paid. I thought this was a long list as I scrolled through. Then I got to the bottom and realized that this was just page one of 13 pages just like it. I literally had to vomit as I scrolled through this list because each of these is a person or groups of people who suffered at the hands of someone they trusted, someone they thought had their best interest at heart, someone they thought cared about their health, someone who had taken an oath to do no harm, but did harm. It would take literal hours to go through each of these, but what I want you to pay attention to here is the cases that are from off-label or unapproved. This is what's happening and it's the easiest one to get away with because these are FDA approved drugs that are being used outside of their approved use. These are the ones that are being pushed by pharmaceutical companies to unsuspecting patients for them and the doctors who prescribe them to become ridiculously wealthy at the peril of their patients who take them. We'll see examples of that in a case in the next episode. These are drugs that have been tested and deemed safe only for certain conditions or in certain doses, but these guidelines are being stomped on and thrown away out of nothing but pure greed, as we'll see in emails from pharmaceutical companies to their reps in the next episode. It starts with the doctor, then the pharmaceutical rep that's pushing the doctor, the managers that are pushing the pharmaceutical reps, to the very top of these billion dollar companies pushing the executives to push the managers. It's a chain of power and pressure 
that doesn't care how many people get hurt as long as the billions keep coming in. These monsters have been sued many times over, but they simply pay and keep going. That's how much money there is to be made here. Big Pharma has been described not as being owned, but as owning, because Big Pharma contributes heavily to the annual budget of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration through their application fees and user fees for its new products. Experts say the industry contributes about two-thirds of the FDA's budget. How does it make sense that the very authority that's supposed to monitor it relies on it for two-thirds of its budget. Big Pharma also uses its profits and an army of 1,378 paid lobbyists to spread its influence on Capitol Hill. It's an out-of-control monster that's impossible to fight. Here's an example. We paid attention to a specific reason for settlements in the list. Do you remember what it was? Off-label promotion. Remember, this is using drugs that are approved, but not approved for the purpose they're being prescribed for. The risks associated with off-label promotion include legal and regulatory consequences. Manufacturers who actively promote off-label uses of their products may face legal and regulatory actions from the FDA. These actions can result in fines, product recalls, or other penalties. Two, patient safety. Off-label use of drugs or medical devices may not have undergone the same rigorous testing and evaluation as their approved indications. This lack of evidence can pose risks to patient safety, as the effectiveness and safety of off-label uses are often uncertain. 3. Misleading information. Promoting off-label uses without proper evidence can mislead healthcare professionals and patients. Inaccurate or incomplete information may lead to inappropriate prescribing or usage, potentially harming patients. 4. Reputation damage. Companies that engage in off-label promotion risk damaging their reputation. Healthcare professionals and patients may lose trust in the manufacturer if they perceive the company as prioritizing profits over patient well-being. 5. Litigation. Legal actions, including lawsuits from patients or healthcare providers, can arise if off-label promotion leads to adverse events or harm. Manufacturers may be held liable for any negative outcomes related to off-label use. 6. Market access and reimbursement. Insurers and payers may be reluctant to cover off-label uses due to the lack of evidence supporting their efficacy and safety. This can impact market access and reimbursement for the product. 7. Ethical Concerns Ethically, promoting off-label uses without robust evidence raises questions about transparency, honesty, and patient-centered care. Manufacturers should prioritize patient health and safety over marketing goals. After all these lawsuits, what happened? An August 2021 article in Deshirt LLP by Mara Cusker Gonzalez shows a dangerous progression of loosening the constraints the FDA had on Big Pharma. Of note, this was not the position of Ms. Gonzalez. This was my observation of her paper. We see a more than five-year development about what intended use means. It was first proposed in 2015 with the final regulation put in place in 2017. Doctors were allowed to use prescriptions for off-label use, but federal law prevented it from being introduced into interstate commerce without approved labeling for intended use. Federal government pursued enforcement of this, deeming this misbranding and a violation of the FDCA. It's misbranding because the FDA requires adequate prescription labeling that includes dosage, indications, side effects, etc. You've probably noticed these instructions given with every prescription you get. If a drug is being used for another purpose, the label and instructions are no longer correct, making it misbranding. 
In order for it to be used outside of its intended purpose or intended dosage, an NDA or new drug application is supposed to be filed with the FDA along with the proposed new labeling for the FDA to approve so that new labeling for the new purpose can be properly made. This is a sort of authorization of a medicine to be used outside of its approved purpose. Note, if you or someone you love has been given a medication for something and the labeling does not indicate for the illness that it has been prescribed for or the dosage that's found in the label, it very well may be that this use is beyond the scope of what has been cleared by the FDA. Your prescription should match the labeling exactly. Back to this 2017 ruling. Notice how it says, certain industry groups didn't care for the wording of the final regulation and petitioned the FDA. After this pressure, the FDA obediently delayed the rule's effective date and reopened the docket, and in 2020, dropped the phrase, totality of the evidence. In 2021, this rule was final and added the following language. A manufacturer's, distributor's, or other seller's knowledge that a product is used for off-label purposes does not by itself give rise to FDCA violations. A firm would not be regarded as intending an unapproved new use for a medical product that is approved, cleared, granted marketing authorization, or exempted from pre-market notification based solely on that firm's knowledge that such product was being prescribed or used by healthcare providers for such use. The agency will determine what evidence is relevant to whether a company is engaging in off-label promotion on a case-by-case -case basis and from the viewpoint of whether a reasonable fact finder would determine that the manufacturer or seller intended the product to be used for off-label purposes. This has a potential to absolve a drug company from wrongdoing, even if they're aware that their drug is being used inappropriately. Which, at first glance, you might think, well, is it their fault if a doctor uses it inappropriately? There's a lot more to that story, and that will be in episode two. So please keep this in mind for now, and continue to keep in mind how many lawsuits were won in the very recent past for this very act and the harm that it led to. In October of last year, a draft was presented to healthcare professionals to comment on. It will no doubt be put through, but guess what the focus for change was? Did you guess off-label use of drugs? Then you're right. They're going to make this okay, meaning people may not be able to sue for damages that may result from the unapproved use of approved medicine and devices. How is this possible? If we look at the introduction, it says this revised draft guidance, when finalized, will provide FDA's current thinking on common questions regarding certain communications by firms. Firms means the medical product manufacturer, packers, distributors, and all of their representatives, including both corporate entities and individuals, to healthcare providers of scientific information on unapproved uses of approved cleared medical products. This whole draft is about the role that Big Pharma is going to be allowed to play in unapproved uses of approved medical products. This is directly related to the lawsuits they've been hit with for off-label use. Now the FDA is still being strict about interstate commerce of prescriptions and medical devices. They do require what's called a PMA. A PMA is a pre-market approval application. So when a healthcare professional wants to use an approved medication for an unapproved purpose, they must fill out this pre-market approval application. Once this application receives approval, then they will be allowed to disperse these prescriptions even in interstate commerce. If it does not go through this process, it's considered misbranding or adulterated. So like I mentioned earlier, part of this approval would be sending in new label instructions for the FDA to approve as well. So there are rules, but rules haven't meant much to Big Pharma, as we've already seen by the list of lawsuits and as we're going to delve into in this mini-series. The caveats are that these pharmaceutical companies will have to be truthful, non-misleading, factual, 
and unbiased and provide all information necessary for healthcare professionals to interpret the strengths and weaknesses and validity and utility of the information, and any study or analysis described in a source publication should be scientifically sound. This is directly from that draft. How crazy is this? In view of all the lawsuits we've seen and all the money we've seen that's being paid to healthcare professionals, we're supposed to trust that with less supervision, they're going to behave better? This is like taking a group of men who've beaten, raped, seriously injured, sometimes to the point of death or near death, women and children, and we put them into women's shelters and say, hey, we know you've been hurting women and children for years, and law enforcement has been trying to stop you, but we're going to be on an honor system now. We want you to be honest here when you self-monitor and self-report your conduct in here with these vulnerable women and children who are in your care. Okay? Sound good? It's crazy. Their refusal to obey the regulations set forth by the federal government has caused harm, has caused addiction, has caused death, has caused illnesses to become worse. But we're going to give them this freedom. They can provide people with medicine as long as they, you know, report honestly. So what can we do? Ladies and gentlemen, let's be honest here. There's no amount of protest or letters we can write, or podcasts we can make that can rival the power, influence, or finances that Big Pharma has. We've seen this 13-page list of recent lawsuits into the billions that have not stopped this monster. I, for one, will not delude myself with thoughts otherwise. All we can do is be aware, learn what signs to look for with our own medical care and the medical care of those we love, so that we can try not to fall prey to it. We can educate ourselves. We can read the label instructions. We can look up our doctors. And that's what I hope to do with this mini-series. So please stay tuned. In Mrs. Mom's case, it was a combination of three FDA-approved drugs that had not been approved to use together. There had been a trial to use two of the drugs, and it has been approved for use in Canada and another country in South America, but not yet the United States. So to sidestep that, they simply put those drugs together. As for the three together, that has been studied, but not approved anywhere. So they simply took three separate FDA-approved drugs and made their own mix, though the use of the three together has not been approved anywhere. And we're no doubt keeping records of it, knowing that these rules are about to change, and they would have a head start in their research to make this pharmaceutical cocktail FDA approved. Coming soon, the case that killed Sarah Fuller. Till then, this is Cassidy O'Connell, saying stay well and stay tuned.